haven't noticed Annabelle stepped up here and brightened up. <laughs> it would be nice to have that effect. <laughs> this Annabelle Griffin will be doing our Bible reading for us this morning. I'm so proud of her being up here. Anybody else? Amen. Philippians 3, and reading verse number 3. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Turning, if you haven't gotten there already, Philippians chapter 3. Uh, before I forget, Lee, thank you so much for that song. I love that song, dearly. I had forgotten, I think I heard y'all practicing that maybe last Sunday evening. It brightened up my evening, it really did. It's good to be here. It's good to be able to have the uh, Bible open before us this morning. Amen. God's Word gives light. It makes the simple wise. Uh, whichever one of those fits you, fits me, both of them. Glad for the Word of God. Before we go into it, though, we'll pray together, uh, as uh, has become our custom, asking God to give us help, because we don't have it without Him. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. As we come in Jesus' name, for all the good things you've done for us, all the good things that you give us. Oh God, if I only had memory enough for just this past week, how many times you've spoken to my heart, spoken to our hearts here today. You've directed us and guided us, encouraged us, chastised us. Lord, you're just constantly there, constantly helping. You use your word to do it. So God, thank you so very much. We're asking you then this morning, God, you told us to desire the sincere milk of the word that we might grow thereby. So we're asking you, God, for growth. We're asking you to build us up. We're asking you to take your word that we're desiring here this morning and do for us what only you can. We ask it in Jesus' name. All God's folks in. Amen. 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 We've been working on a study that I'd entitled No Confidence in the Flesh from Philippians chapter 3, before and after. And you'll recall circumcision was the sign or the token or the reminder of the covenant that God made with Abraham and his descendants. And it was put in place in Genesis 17. Now, after the time of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, his 12 sons, the descendants of Abraham were fast becoming a nation, as is chronicled in Exodus chapter 1. And this covenant then became, uh, as it were, such that it was between God and the nation of Abraham's descendants, or God and the nation of Israel. Now, this covenant... Uh, is what we today refer to as the Old Covenant or the Old Testament, uh, the writings of which are the first 39 books you'll find in our Bible. And this sign or this token, this reminder, this circumcision, we've been talking about that for several weeks now, it was applied to eight-day-old infants, according to the Word of God, again from Genesis chapter 17. Now, as of Matthew 27, verse number 51, and the event described there, and I'm sure that uh, if you look it up, you'd be reminded, the veil that separated the holy place from the holiest place split right down the middle from the top to the bottom. Okay? I've often thought probably uh, the folks that were in the temple that day set fast about figuring out how they could get it fixed. Well, thank God it couldn't be fixed, amen. Because <laughs> that's when God let everybody know that things were changing and that access to His presence had been made, made available to all folks. 
uh, you'll find that explained, if you will, and chronicled in the New Testament book of Hebrews. And uh, thank God for that book. Well, anyway, the New, New Covenant, New Testament, is not made between God and a nation. It was made between God and individuals, if you will, to as many as received him, John 1.12. Whosoever believeth in him, John 3.16. If any man thirst, let him come, John 7.37. And whosoever will, Revelation 22.17. That's why we, as New Testament Bible-believing churches, do what we call believer's baptism. Believer's baptism means that we baptize people who have decided to follow Jesus, okay? I know there are folk uh, who have been baptized and probably will be baptized if that doesn't apply to, but that's nothing we can do anything about. That's what it's about. Someone decides, I'm going to heed God's call. That's why New Testament uh, Bible-believing churches do not do infant baptism. That's, of course, the idea of baptizing babies who have not yet, who cannot yet, make a decision for Christ. That's why we don't do that. Uh, we're not casting any stones at anyone who will. But we know that the covenant relationship offered by God is for whosoever will, let him come. And that can't happen with an infant. That's also why we as New Testament Bible-believing churches don't christen babies. We don't christen babies. That uh, activity, that celebration, is something that's done to formally, formally, excuse me, name a baby as a sign of admission to Christ's church. In fact, the word christen comes directly from the Latin word Christus, uh, or Christ, and it signified to make someone a Christian. So there we are again. The same reason we don't baptize infants is the same reason we don't christen babies because babies, infants, cannot make their mind up to become Christians until they're old enough. Again, not casting stones at anyone. It's just plain off the pages of the Bible. The New Covenant, the New Testament, is made between God and any individual who, according to John 6, 44 and 45, has been drawn by the Father, has been, has, excuse me, has heard the Father, and who has learned of the Father and has made the decision to come to Christ Jesus for salvation. So Paul, borrowing this expression, circumcision, from the Old Testament vernacular, tells the Philippian disciples, and us, if you will, New Testament circumcision, that token, sign, reminder, symbol, visible clue, public display, that gesture that we are in right relationship, covenant relationship with God, it's actually threefold. And we get that, of course, from verse 3, Philippians chapter 3. Rather than being surgically altered, one, we worship God in the Spirit, Two, we rejoice in Christ Jesus. Three, we have no confidence in the flesh. Let me pull off to the shoulder for just a minute. Aren't you glad for the Word of God? Amen. This is where we're instructed. This is how we find out what's going on between us and God as we learn Him describing this thing in the Bible. Number one, we worship God in the Spirit. Our worship, though it may take different outward forms begins within us. It's real. Uh, it flows from true affection for God. It's not mechanical. It's a response uh, to God's attention to and affection for us. Number two, we rejoice in Christ Jesus. We find as our reason for this calm happiness of soul we find as the origin of our sense of inward well-being, we find as the cause for the peace of God ruling in our hearts, Jesus Christ alone. Who He is, what He's done, what He's doing, 
what he's promised, our only re reason for all of our rejoicing is him. Is him. Never can too much be made of Jesus and what he's accomplished. He is our salvation. And then number three, we have no confidence in the flesh. The word confidence, uh, as is often the case, a key word to our understanding here, is the Greek word pytho, and it's the root word for every time you'll find used in the New Testament the word faith, faithful, trust, believe, or belief. This word pytho carries the meaning of being persuaded or being convinced that something is true. In its use as Christian faith, quote unquote, it means to be persuaded or convinced that what the Bible says is the truth. Doesn't mean you necessarily understand it, doesn't mean that you always like it, but you're convinced that it's so. Down on the inside, you know that it's so. The old timers used to say, I know that I know that I know. May not be able to explain it to anybody, but I know it. That's faith. But it's used here as no confidence in the flesh connotes being persuaded or convinced that there's nothing about my flesh that gives me any confidence whatsoever. Now, in other words, if you will, Paul is telling us that the third token, the third sign, the third reminder, public display, or gesture that we're in actual covenant relationship with God is knowing this, what I am, what I have, what I've done, what I plan to do will not help me a whit when the death angels come for me. You say, what are you talking about? We don't know anything at all about death other than Jesus brought a few folks who were dead back to life. Bad part about that was they had to die again. Amen? Amen. We know this much about death. Jesus conquered it. That's why he's the only one that once died, never will die again. Amen. Made the statement, I am he that was dead and am alive. Ain't nobody in here can say that. Amen? amen. Except a few of y'all after the last amen when I get done at 2.30. <laughs> when you'll rise from the seeming dead. No. <clears throat> Paul's third token, if you will, that we really are in actual relationship with God is knowing that I have no confidence in my flesh, none whatsoever. It's knowing that my accomplishments, my attainments, my achievements, my abilities, my training, my skills will not help me a whit when I stand before God on Judgment Day. In other words, I have, you have, Paul has, no disciple has any confidence in the flesh. None. We're persuaded. We're convinced that our flesh is not going to help us. Amen. It's knowing that when I contemplate seeing God face to face, the only thing that gives me any hope, the only thing that will be of any help to me, the only thing that will recommend me to God, to His favor, and to His blessing is not my flesh, it's Jesus Christ. Amen. Because we have no confidence in the flesh. This is probably foolish. I'll apologize up front for that. I don't know what it's going to be like when we die. We are told that the beggar Lazarus was carried by angels to the bosom of Abraham. That's the only clue we've got of what practically is going to take place when your inward man gives up the ghost. Okay? That part we know. Now what happens after that is only speculation. The Bible says that to be absent from the body, in so many words, is to be present with Christ. This part is where I'm headed for. Not knowing exactly what we're going to face, Many's the time I've contemplated. You ever been somewhere and all of a sudden didn't know what to say? Confronted by someone you weren't ready to see or someone who slightly intimidates you and you're at a loss for words. You ever been there? Yeah. If I'm at a loss for words, and forgive me for being foolish, when I stand before God, all of a sudden snatched up out of my bed or from a plate of chili dogs, whatever the case may be, 
If I'm at a loss for words, just say Jesus. Amen. Just say mercy. Just say I'm saved by the blood of the Lamb. Whatever you do, don't ask for justice. Amen? Amen. Just Christ. Just mercy. Just the cross. I have no confidence in my flesh whatsoever. Well, for our benefit, verse 5 and 6 of Philippians 3, Paul gives us an example of what confidence in the flesh would look like. If you will, verse 5 and 6, Paul gives us his own former perspective on life, showing what confidence in the flesh looks like. One last one, verse 5 and 6, Paul gives us the typical Jewish perspective, and I've got that in close, in quotes rather, which is based entirely on confidence in the flesh. Let me read verse 5 and 6. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. If you will, allow me a brief paraphrase there. Circumcised on the eighth day of his life was exactly what Genesis 17, 12 said was to happen. He was a descendant of Jacob, thus a descendant of Abraham. He came from the family or the tribe of Benjamin, which was Jacob's youngest son. He was a Hebrew from amongst other Hebrews. Now, by the way, just a brief mention here, it's, it's presumed, I think would be the safest word. This uh, idea of Hebrew, the word Hebrew, where does it come from? It's presumed he was a, uh, a descendant of Asher, one of the twelve sons of Jacob, by the name of Heber. And Heber, eh, people think maybe that's where Hebrew came from, don't know, I just thought I'd toss that in. But he was a Hebrew amongst other Hebrews. Concerning the Jewish version of God's law, he was a Pharisee. Now it's always important to remember what you're learning in the Bible. The Jews touted being folk of the law. We hold up the law. We abide by the law. Why don't your disciples do like we do and follow the traditions of the law? That's always in contradistinction to the real law. This was their version of it. Remember what was it? Matthew chapter 15. Uh, the Pharisees were... Uh, uh, picking on Jesus, your disciples don't do as good as we do. We wash every time you eat. Why don't your disciples do like we do? Jesus answered their question with a question of his own. Why do you folks transgress God's law by your version of the law? You remember that? Always remember that's what we're talking about here. Paul says concerning the Jewish version of the law, he was a Pharisee. Now the Pharisees... In our rendition of them in the Bible, they always wear black hats. He said, I don't remember reading that. Well, you won't. I was watching a movie just then, and I don't remember what it was, some highly spiritual Western. And did you know that sure enough, when the black guy showed up, or the bad guy, rather, he had a black hat on? He really did. I don't know what the deal is. These guys would have had the black hats. The name Pharisee, the word Pharisee, literally means someone who's set apart. It's possible that the Pharisee, the sect of the Pharisee, was begun with a good motive. We don't know that for certain. But it almost instantaneously became a holier-than-thou club. We are set apart from everybody else because we want to do right. We're those that do right. Our aim, our goal, our accomplishment is rightness, and none of the rest of you folks are that way. That's the way they came across. So he says, according to the Jewish version of God's law, I was one of the set-apart ones. I was one of the guys who, in his thinking, wore a white hat, but in reality did not. Verse 6, concerning religious fervor or religious zeal, Paul assured his readers that he was doing his dead-level best prior to his conversion to stamp out the church of that dead false prophet, Jesus of Nazareth. That's what he thought, remember? <clears throat> That's why he got orders from Jerusalem and was on his way to Damascus to kill people, to imprison people, to hail people, and haul them back to Jerusalem and throw them in the slammer. 
Jesus was false. And you people that followed him were false. Well, that plan got shot all to pieces when Jesus showed up on the road to Damascus. Amen? But he said, listen, concerning fervor, I was out to destroy everything that I thought was against our Jewish version of God's law. And then concerning the keeping of this Jewish version of God's law, I was absolutely blameless. For Paul, prior to his conversion, he's telling us, this is what would give me favor before God. This is what will get me into heaven. This is what will put me in right stead with God. Do you remember, y'all, uh, if you're like me, and I pray that you're not, I lose, lose track from one reading of the Gospels to the next. And on my daily Bible reading, that's a year, year at a time, annually. And read uh, through uh, two of the Gospels recently, uh, Jesus at his trial, you remember who he stood trial before? It wasn't Pilate. Pilate didn't have him on trial. Pilate was just questioning him because the Jews brought Jesus to him to get permission to kill him. He was on trial by the religious Jews. The high priest questioned him, do you recall? Accused him of blasphemy, tore his robes, called out for the people's will, of course having planted the seed, to crucify him, crucify him. Do you remember that when Pilate finally, uh, as Jesus was brought there, after Jesus was brought to him, asked him, asked them, why is it you want to kill this innocent man? And Pilate said, I don't want his blood on me. And the Jews spoke up, his blood be on us, and on our children. Now y'all, they thought they were right. Trouble was, they won't. Right? You ever thought you were right and found out you were wrong? Anybody? They thought they were right, but they were wrong. Yet they went on record before God Almighty and saying, put the blame of his death on us. Well, they got it. They got it. They really did. But y'all, stop and think just for a minute. These people really believed that what they were doing was going to put them in right stead with God. You, you can't talk about certain folk today without being a bad guy. Amen. You can't talk about homosexuals or you're a bigot. You can't talk about Muslims because they serve the same God we do, right? Wrong. Wrong with a capital wrong. But these people think they're right. You say, well, doesn't that count for something? Yeah, it counts for the fact that they're wrong. <laughs> Y'all, hey, it's not up to us to be tolerant. It's up to us to be faithful to the Word of God. Amen. God is not going to ask me, were you tolerant with all people groups one day? He's going to ask me, did you do what I told you to do? But these people think they're right. But they're wrong. Paul honestly thought he would be in better stead with God because he persecuted Jesus' church than if he'd just been a wallflower. He really believed that. Amen. They really believe it. Folk, you hate to say it because that's another crowd you keep talking about. Jews today believe the same thing. Did you know there's still a curse on the name Jesus of Nazareth in traditional Orthodox Jewish, uh, Jewish religion today. It stands. They don't brag about it, but it's the truth. They think they're right, but that doesn't count for much, y'all. Mm. For Paul, prior to his conversion, it's as if he's telling us here, this is what I trust in. I was circumcised. I'm a descendant of Abraham. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I'm a Pharisee. I'm zealous. I'm blameless. This is what I'm going to tell God at the judgment. This is what I place my confidence in. Right. He really thought that. 
Amen. And did you know that there are people who really think such things today? Mm -hmm. You ever run into somebody who thought that they were pretty good at egg? And, and uh, you know, when I stand before God, I heard a old boy tell me one time, well, I'm, I'm, I'm better than most folk. <laughs> well, you mad man. Not good enough. But you see, Paul understood, and that's why he's writing this. When he was brought face to face with the living Jesus Christ, he realized that these things, in fact, verse number 7, what he counted as gain were actually a loss. <clears throat> what he counted as gain was actually a loss. Interesting. Another key word uh, in our discussion here this morning, the word loss used in 3 7, the book of Philippians, literally means a detriment. A detriment. Say, well, what are we talking about? Now? Think about that thing. Paul says, the things that I counted as gain <clears throat> were actually a detriment to my coming to God. Now, think with me, if you will. Someone who's impressed with himself. Someone who's confident in himself. Someone who feels like he's a pretty good fella. This is a decided detriment to his ever being saved. You may have encountered someone like that. You see, the person who does not feel as if he needs saving is the person that feels that he needs no Savior. And you all know that. You can put it more eloquently than me, but let me repeat that for my sake. The person who feels as if he needs no saving is the person that feels that he needs no Savior. And there is nothing more detrimental to anyone's eternal uh, destiny Amen. than not believing you need to be saved. Have you ever, may I ask you point blank, have you ever felt that way yourself? Obviously, you've come to Christ since then. You ever talked with anyone who felt like they didn't need to be saved? An old boy told me one time, saved from what? So what perfect sense it makes to my mind that God would use this word, translated loss in verse 7, as a detriment. You see, Paul saw Christ. And evidently that seeing him was enough to waylay everything he had held about Christ for all of those years as a zealous Pharisee. And he realized what I thought was gain was really a detriment here to me. Paul's telling us then in this passage, the third token, the third sign, the third reminder, the third public display, the third gesture that we are in actual covenant relationship with God is that I realize, I'm convinced, I'm persuaded that I am a lost person and that means completely lost. I am a sinner and that's not an honorary title. I earned it. It's being persuaded that I need saving. I cannot save myself. And it's being convinced that I need the Savior, Jesus Christ. He is my only hope. And it means that I'm not ashamed to admit this publicly or privately. The third token of our being in right relationship with God is that we're willing to admit, I'm a sinner. And I need a Savior. Find someone who's ashamed of Christ ashamed of the cross, ashamed of the church, ashamed of the Bible, and you'll find someone who does not exhibit this third gesture, if you will, third token of being in covenant relationship with God. You're here today, and you know you're a lost person. I'm talking about without Christ. You know you're a sinner. You know you need Savior. You know you need the Savior. You know, without Christ, you ain't got a snowball's chance and you know where. Did you know that's a token of the work of God in you, letting you know in anyone who comes to know you, man, you're in covenant relationship with God. Only a genuine disciple will believe that. 
I've known folk that said, testified privately, well, I've given my life to Christ. <coughs> All right, make it public. Oh, I can't do that. Yes, you can. As long as it happens in here, that's all that matters, right? Wrong. If it happens in here, you'd be willing to do it publicly. Mm -hmm. I mean, who, how can we be ashamed of the one that's given us salvation? Mm -hmm. And I realize there's a learning curve there. I, I realize that we have to you know, learn. We've got to stand up. We've got to man up. Woman up, whatever the case may be. The religious Jew could not accept the fact that Messiah had to die on the cross to pay their sin debt. That's what the Bible calls the offense of the cross. Galatians 5, verse number 11. We can buy Jesus. We can buy Jesus of Nazareth possibly being the Messiah. But we will not buy that Messiah had to die on the cross to pay for my sin. I don't need it. I don't need it. I'm circumcised. I'm a descendant of Abraham. From the tribe of Jacob. Or the family of Benjamin, rather. Descendant of Jacob. So on and so forth. Uh -huh. The offense of the cross. But the Bible-believing disciple of Jesus, on the other hand, Galatians 6.14, glories in cross. Paul wrote Galatians 6.14, God forbid that I should glory, save, accept in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. If you will, I have no confidence in my flesh. Amen. One last thought, Joe. Isn't it good that we don't have to have confidence in my flesh? Amen. This probably doesn't apply to anybody in here but me. I've reached old coot status. <laughs> I'm going to look that up in the dictionary one day. I probably won't be able to find it. But that means I'm an old coot. That's about all I ever do. An old coot can't do what he used to could do. I can remember a day when I thought I could do anything. I've reached the point where I can't remember if I ever did anything. <laughs> Aren't you glad we don't have to depend on our on our flesh? Amen. I don't know about you. Anybody sin this past week? Oh yeah. I shouldn't have. I mean, a lot of us in here, we've been walking with the Lord for a long time. I ought to have that down pat. But I ain't. But I don't have to have, have confidence in me. I've got confidence in a Savior whose apostle wrote, if any man sin, if any man sin, let him confess that sin to God. Amen? Amen. He be cleaned up. No confidence in the flesh. Oh, I think that's the sweetest words I've ever read out of this Bible. How about this and I'll close. Where have you placed your confidence? Where have you placed your confidence? Now, only you know this answer about you, only I know this answer about me. But whatever that answer is, it tells you everything you need to know about where you are. Bear with me. If you were to die this afternoon, and you find yourself standing before God, what would you want to communicate from your inward man to Him? That's the reason he ought to let you in his heaven. That tells you everything you know, need to know about where you are. <clears throat> is it Christ crucified? Or is it something you've done, something I've done? Not in this lifetime. Where have you placed your confidence? Pray with me if you will. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for the privilege of this access to you, your access to us. It's come through the person and work of Christ. I know I take it for granted. 
Lord, I'm sorry for every time I've done that. But with the eye of faith we see here this morning, that He's the Savior, not me. He's the one that can do the saving, not me. He's the one whose merit pays every debt that I've ever owed. Not me. But perchance there's anyone here today who leans to his own understanding who's counting on you remembering doing they're doing certain things. He's got a copy of their spiritual resume filed away to give to you when they see you. <clears throat> Be there chance, God for chance, someone here who has confidence in their flesh. Lord, please grant that sweetest of all thoughts. Jesus paid it all. It's all to him we owe. Please help us, Lord, then in these concluding moments to hear your voice, to understand what you're applying to our lives, and to do so with thankfulness. We ask in Christ's name. As we continue praying, we're saying, God spoke into your heart, won't you come and see?